Good afternoon and welcome to our webinar um, about methods for producing high quality cord blood stem cells for clinical use. I hope you're all keeping well um, and warm now that we're heading into winter. Um, I want to thank you all for attending. Um, we're very excited about this webinar and we have with us a Todd from uh, Cryocell in the US um, who's going to be talking you through the webinar for today. At uh, NetCells, we've been investigating for a while um, different ways of um, processing the cord blood stem cells. And uh, in our research, we came across Cryocell, which has a um, unique method in how they process their cord blood stem cells, which is something that NetCells is um, going to be adopting um, in the next few weeks. So we thought we would take this opportunity uh, to explain a bit more about this method. Um, and we thought no better than Todd um, to explain it to us. Now, Todd is the lab director at Cryocell uh, with many years experience in the cord blood industry. And I will now hand over to you, Todd. Thank you, Shelley. Uh, I'd like to thank everybody for attending. Uh, hopefully this won't be too boring for you. Um, I'd also like to thank uh, NetCells for, for having me. So we're, we're gonna go ahead and start the presentation. Uh, just uh, an, overview, an overview to show you what we're gonna be going over. Uh, just a quick introduction, a history of, of cord blood. Uh, why net cells and we chose Prepocyte. So I'll go over some of the advantages of that, uh, why people use cord blood or should use cord blood, and then some uh, just uh, brief overview of what other uses and, and uh, big advancements of, of cord blood that have recently happened, and then uh, future uses. So, I'd like to start this off by sharing a video with you that I saw a few years ago. Um, it's not an accusation, it's just something interesting that you can look at something that you've been doing every day and you think you're doing it right, but maybe there's another way, maybe there's a better way. And uh, when I found this video, I did find out that I was tying my shoes wrong. So anyways, it's a, it's a little entertaining and, and I hope you enjoy it, it's, it's not very long. Pull the nut, 
spirit in it's a strong form of mission. Now, in keeping with today's theme, I'd like to point out, and something you already know, that sometimes a small advantage someplace in life can yield tremendous results someplace else. Uh oh, you guys there? Yes, we are still here, Todd. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, essentially, it's kind of an overarching theme through this whole presentation, and that is that a slight advantage can yield large results, and you'll see that throughout the remainder of this presentation. So. I just wanted to, to give you a brief history of, of cord blood. In, in 1988, there was the first cord blood transplant for Fanconi anemia. And then uh, five years later, they started using unrelated or allogeneic cord blood. And then in 2002, they ex vivo expanded cord blood to uh, use in a transplant, and it was successful. So why is that important? Well. The, the knock on cord blood is that, uh, you know, after age 16 or 17, it's pretty much useless because the dose isn't large enough. So that's why there's been so much attention paid to expanding the cord blood to, uh, stem cells. So then, uh, you know, you go over to 2013 and you see that uh, they started treating hypoxic ischemia. So neurological diseases are now being explored and actually being treated quite nicely. In 2016, Dr. Kurtzberg, who happens to be our medical director, she uh, did a, a phase one study on autism and showed very positive results, uh, so much so in fact that she used the same protocol to treat cerebral palsy also. And she's expanded this into allogeneic usage and also she's using uh, MSCs from the cord tissue. So, as the gentleman mentioned on the TED Talk, slight advantages yield great results sometimes in life. So, what are the advantages of, of cord blood compared to bone marrow or peripheral blood stem cells? Well, there's a, there's a growing body of evidence that shows that younger cells work better. And I'll, I'll touch on that on the next slide. Uh, but, you know, it's pretty much medical waste. You're just throwing it away. There's no ethical concerns. There's no risk to the donor like there is from a, a marrow harvest or, or a stem cell, peripheral blood stem cell collection. And because of its naivety, uh, there's less HLA matching. So this is advantageous to uh, minorities or others that cannot find uh, a large pool of donors. So speaking to the, to the point of younger cells are better, well, why is that? There's been many publications, and I'm sure you've heard of them, you know, that the telomeres are the protective coating on the end of chromosomes. And as cells divide over time, these telomeres, they degrade, which means that the DNA becomes less protected, and eventually the telomeres will disappear, the DNA degrades, it mutates, and cell death occurs. So, the longer the telomeres, the more proliferative, the more functional the cells are. So that brings me to prepocyte, which is, is the, the main portion of, of why I'm here. So there, there are plenty of processing technologies out there and, and they all work pretty good. So why is it that, that we chose and, and net cells chose prepocyte. Well, I'm just gonna show you a little animation on how this works. So the cord blood is added to the bag along with the prepocyte, and then the red cells sediment down at the bottom. Now the prepocyte encourages the red cells to sediment to the bottom through what's called a rouleau effect, and that's just like the, the red cells are stacking on top of one another, and then gravity takes hold and, and pulls them all down. The white cells in the plasma stay in suspension, 
and then the top layer of that, which is the white cells and the, and, and the plasma are removed and the red cells are, are left in the bag and the process goes on. That's the physical separation. That's, that's the big difference. So in other methods, such as, as head of starch and CPACs and, and AXB, which is a, it's, it's a, a little container, it's mechanical and you, you put the blood bag in there and you put it in the centrifuge, spin it down and it kind of does its, its thing um, while in the centrifuge. So this method, all three are related by forming a buffy coat. So everything sediments down to the bottom and then the buffy coat, which is the white cell layer, stays on top of the red cells. And then of course, up here on top, you have the plasma. And then the buffy coat is harvested. So the problem with the buffy coat being harvested is that you get crossover. So you get red cells going into the buffy coat layer or some of the white cells are, are a little bit lower in the red cell layer. So if you want, if you want more white cells, you're, you're going to get more red cells. And if you want less red cells, you're gonna get less white cells. So this is just uh, this slide is just talking about you know what what are the advantages you know so you, with the manual method you could process any size cord such as head of starch you couldn't do that with CPACs or HES which are machine methods uh, you can only process some cords they have they have um, volume limitations so back to the manual methods. Uh, which is uh, head of starch with this buffy coat layer it's hard to get consistent results and that's why people choose the machine method because you know it's more consistent results but again you have that volume limitation with prefacite since there is such a clean separation of the white cells and the red cells because the white cells remain suspended in plasma there's less operator variation and we can process any size cord. We, we've received cords in here that are 40 mils and that is with 35 mils of CPD. So we've processed five mils of cord blood. Now, a lot of times these are obviously suboptimal. We, we have minimal cell counts, but there are times when the cord is, is very cellular and we are, we are able to produce a, a great product off of five mils. It's amazing. So this is what Perpicide looks like. It comes in a bulk bag, and uh, I, have, I have to apologize for the transfer set. This is a Paul transfer set picture I had to pull from the web. My uh, representative wasn't very responsive in my request for a picture. But anyways, so essentially, the the core the core blood collection bag is connected to this primary centrifuge bag, and then the Perpicide is placed in the in the collection bag sediment. And then after that, the plasma and the white cells are, are placed in the centrifuge bag. The whole set is put in the centrifuge, spun down, and then the excess plasma is expressed from this bag into this waste bag. And then the remaining cells, uh, you know, your desired final product volume is then placed into the freezer bag and the DMSO is added and then frozen. So outside of the, the physical separation, what, what does that yield? Well, here's a comparison of all the major processing technologies. And what you're looking at here is CFU recovery and RBC depletion. So you all know what RBCs are. What are CFUs? It stands for colony forming units. And why is that important? Because the colony forming unit dose best predicts neutrophil and platelet engraftment with a fantastic p-value. So uh, essentially the CFU is an assay where they grow out the stem cells on, on media and then they count the number of colonies and this will uh, reveal the, the clonogenic potential or the stemness, the functionality of the stem cells. And so what this is showing you is that Prepocyte recovers the most functional clonogenic stem cells. And, and why is that? There's not been enough evidence, you know, not, not enough studies. People haven't 
really dove into that. They're just happy that it works. I, I believe that it's because we're recovering more of the of the younger stem cells, those that probably got lost in the red cell layer of the Buffy coat, but now that they're floating around in the plasma, we can capture those. So as you can see here, there's there's a great advantage of using Premisec. And at the same time, RBC depletion is fantastic. And, and why is that important? Well, you know, every method is fine. And when they thaw the cord blood, you perform a wash. And that washes away the red cells. And so then that's fine, you know, and then you can infuse it into the child or the adult. And, and there's there's not much risk of, of toxicity from that. But the problem with that is that when you do that, you're damaging the cells more with an extra spin and you're losing about 10% of the cells through centrifugation. So, you know, great, you recover 62% of your CFUs, then you just lose another five to 10%. You almost have half of the functional cells that you started out with. Well, with Preposite, there's no need to wash. You can, you can dilute and infuse and every viable cell that you got out of the thaw goes into the patient and it's not lost in, in centrifugation. So I think that that is fantastic. So what does that show? What does it all mean? So here is the days to recovery. So this is this means that it's how many days did the, did the patient go post-transplant without an immune system? So your ANC, the benchmark is ANC 500, which really shows that the patient is, is recovering their, their immune system and you know can be let out of the, the bubble per se. So these numbers right here were pulled from FDA BLA registrations of St. Louis, New York, and Duke Medical Center. So these were submitted to our government and accepted as, as the standard transplant times in order for them to get their biological licensing agreement for their cord blood product. Um, I'm sure that my medical director who works for the Duke University uh, probably would give me a look for sharing this data, but it is public knowledge and I'd appreciate if you saw her that you wouldn't tell her. Um, anyways, all jokes aside, uh, Preposite engrafts five to six days sooner than, than these other methods. And, and that is a fact. So what does that mean for the patient? Well, it's five less days in the hospital. It's five less days that they are exposed to infection. It's five days quicker that they can go home and five days quicker that they get their immune system back. So it's, it's, an, amazing, it's, an, it's an amazing product to, to offer this patient. And not only that, I'm sure that, the, um, sure that the insurance would love that. So after you know, giving you a, a brief introduction to Preposite, I can see how you know, perhaps you're still not interested. And, and that's fine. I, I still like to continue. Um, the cord blood, how long do they last? You know, it's, it's a relatively new technology, freezing and thawing cells and infusing them. Uh, back in 2011, uh, Hal Broxmeyer, who's one of the foremost authorities on cord blood, he thawed some cells and found out uh, that they were all functional, completely functional, uh, high efficiency of recovery, and they were 23 and a half years old. You couldn't get much older because that's pretty much when they really started to freeze down the cord blood. Uh, this year, we thawed a sample here that was 24 years old. We were one of the first cord bloods that, that started, cord blood banks that started, and we thawed one from 96, and it was over 86% viable for the CD34. So we are seeing the same results. And then there's no doubt that they are still functional um, after any amount of year. So, you know, it's been 20 years, there hasn't been much progress. You're probably thinking, you know, there's cancers and now we're getting into to neurological treatment. Uh, what else is going on? Well, it's, it's almost exponentially expanding as far as the uses in the recent past five years. There's, there's many mesenchymal stem cell treatments now. There's even more expansions. There's, there's plenty of companies that um, have, have popped up, Gameta Cell, and, Magenta, NOLA. Um, there's successful autism trials uh, with cord blood and cerebral palsy, and I'll, I'll briefly touch on those. More recently, they were able to take NK cells out of cord blood and uh, tag a, a chimeric, chimeric antigen receptor onto it. 
and it was very successful, and I'll discuss this on the next slide. Um, and also recently, they've been harvesting exosomes from um, MSCs cultured from umbilical cord tissue to uh, treat other diseases also. That's very new. So the recent CAR NK results came out of MD Anderson. They had 11 patients with some pretty nasty lymphomas and leukemias. And seven of those patients had a complete response after a year. So it really took. And the, the, um, the great thing about it is that there was no cytokine release syndrome. So with the CAR T cells, the, the, the issue is, you know, first of all, it has to be the patient's own cells. These were off the shelf, allogeneic, same cells were given to 11 different patients. No cytokine release system, syndrome or neurotoxicity. So that is a great advantage over CAR T cells. Eight of them responded, seven of them had a complete response. They lost a few others right away, unfortunately. Uh, since I'm doing okay on time, I'd like to show you our medical director. She, this, she's at a couple of conferences here, and this is going to show you a patient after receiving stem cells. This one is for cerebral palsy. I just have to skip to, just bear with me, I'll skip to her point of showing the patient. So this is above and what we have already been expected for our child with this form of CT. Um, you can see the um, for now we do and they're seeing many of the children respond that way um, with cerebral palsy and here she is presenting uh, a video of a patient from the autism trial oh, well. sorry i hope that's not too loud just show you a couple of videos to illustrate the point so um, this is a child at baseline they're looking at him from two angles Okay, so he has a lot of the typical symptoms of an autistic child, repetitive behaviors. Not interacting with his dad, not really engaging in play. Okay, and then here's this child six months later. Um, and of course, you could say to me, well, he's a different day, different time, he feels better. He's, you know, but this is, this is what it is. So as you can see, these therapies are clearly changing lives, not only of the child, but of the families. I can only imagine uh, the emotions that a parent feels when they, when they go through something like this, being a parent myself. So it's a real option. It's a real and viable option. The autism trial over here has become so successful, she's been a, granted expanded access so that she can treat more children. Um, in one of her presentations, somebody asked her, how many people have asked to gain 
you know, access to this trial. And she said that she had 20,000 unanswered emails. Oh, sorry. So just briefly, uh, I know I'm starting to run a little late. This is just real quick about expansion of stem cells. So as you can see, it's grown. These are all clinical trials and these are all private companies outside of, of MD Anderson. And also um, uh, there was another one called Exaltera that did UM-171. Gametocell was just granted a phase three. And then here are just some examples of, of core blood expansion trials and that they've been going on for almost 20, you know, almost 20 years. But these are these are for the, the past five years. They're really ramping up. So where to? Where, where, if somebody were to ask me, where do I see this going in the future? Well, just in the past five years, there's, there's been so much um, that has been found uh, applicable for cord blood usage. Um, you know, I didn't save cord blood of my 16 year old. I was in gene therapy at the time, so I just figured we could always just take our own cells and tweak them a little bit. But knowing what I know now, especially out of the past five years, I think it'd be great to to have that cord blood. I mean, you know, say you have a child now and 70 years from now, what, what are we gonna be able to do? Well, I'm, some people say this, I think it's kind of a humorous. Uh, I don't know if it's a disease, I and mean, I don't know if it's curable, but what I do know is that this lady, Enrico von Andelschipper, donated her body to science. I believe this is back in 2015. She passed away at 115 years old. And they studied her body. They didn't find any diseases, no heart attacks, no strokes. She was in perfect health. She simply died of old age. And what they found was three stem cells were the only cells reproducing all of her blood cells, which means all, all of her immune cells. So they determined that she had oligoclonal hematopoiesis. And essentially it was just due to the shortening of her telomeres. The, those remaining cells divided so often that the telomeres lost you know, all of their length, the DNA mutated and she passed on stem cell exhaustion. So based on this, conceivably, let's say we're 70 years old, you know, perhaps you can give yourself a, a little bit of an injection of cord blood, give yourself a little boost, um, you know, maybe just a life improvement. And heck, maybe if you golf, it'll give you an edge over your, your golfing buddy for, you know, a few months or a year. Maybe it helps you pick up your grandchild. Um, just a quality of life improvement. I see that as a definite possibility. So I'd like to thank you all for your time and I'll open it up to questions. I'm not sure how that works, but I'm sure we can, we can get through it. So thank you. Thank you so much, Todd. That was, um, that was absolutely amazing. Uh, I don't, we do have a few questions. I'm not too sure if you can see them on your side. Oh boy. Do I otherwise, I can, otherwise I can send them to you. Um, I'll, I'll tell you what they are. So the first question is, um, what is the maximum volume of cord blood that can be processed using the Preposite system? So it depends on, on your collection bags. There are workarounds. We have a I think Paul's collection bag is 320, 330 mils. So we, we have a cutoff of 180 mils, and then we have a procedure to use a larger bag. Another option would be splitting them. So there, there really is no, there is no upper limit. There's, there's procedures uh, to process and recover uh, just as well as, as, a, as, as a lower volume. Fantastic, thank you. Um, and then what is the reason for the faster engraftment after using the preposite method? What, I'm sorry, what is the reason for? What is the reason for the faster engraftment? So the, the reason, it, it's all about quick engraftment. Um, so a lot of, of adult transplants centers will use peripheral blood stem cells because they engraft quicker than bone marrow. Um, 
one of the reasons is insurances don't like to to pay. I mean, to be quite honest, if you talk the business sense, they want to get you in and out. They want to get you healed and out of the hospital. So do the hospitals. Uh, but really, for the patient, the quicker you engraft, the safer it is. The longer that you go without an immune system, the more chance, the greater the chance you have of getting a simple infection. And quite frankly, some people will die. Some people will die of the flu if they get the flu without an immune system. So that is why it's so important that these post-transplant patients that have their immune system knocked down for the transplant, they are in essentially a bubble or, or um, in, in, you know, there's an ante room, there's a, there's a barrier and everything is sanitized to make sure that the patients post-transplant don't get sick. So it's, it's the most important matrix is how quick to engraft them you know, if they engraft, because then that means the patient can leave. And then, uh, Todd, what is the reason that Prepocyte has quicker engraftment times? So the reason is it's from being able to recover more of those functional stem cells and to create a cleaner environment through uh, the RBC reduction, but mainly, uh, this CFU assay, the colony forming unit assay, best predicts engraftment. And so the more CFUs you have, the, the more stronger, the more potent the dose is. And see if the, the prepocyte, above all other methods, can recover the greatest amount of CFUs. So you can see that in the results, which is less time to engraft. Brilliant, thanks. I've got another question here. Um, is there published data that reflects that cord blood has been utilized after 30 years storage? My understanding is as per your data presented, 20 to 23 years is the current published data. Yeah, correct. So you would tack nine years on that. So yeah, it would be close to, to 30 years. And absolutely, it's, it, you know, it happens all the time now. You can see, publications from the autism that was just released. Uh, I can go and pull any uh, cord blood trial publication and show you. Oh, wait a minute, I see what you're saying. Um, nobody has specifically designed a trial to pull the oldest cord bloods because you need a donor, I'm sorry, you need a recipient for that, that is in need of that specific cord blood. So that question can only be answered when that cord blood is pulled, and I'm sure somebody will publish that. But it can be, there can be other cord bloods pulled, such as how Broxmire did, and perform all these functionality tests, which are done pre-transplant anyways, that show that the transplant would work. But that, that would be the best that, um, Think academia could do at this point. Right. Um, and then at Cryosol, um, what, how many releases have you had of cord blood and what have most of the releases been for? So we have two sides to our, our, our bank. We have a public bank and we have a private bank. And I can tell you in just the last year, we've had 16 cords released just for autism alone. And in our public bank, we had 25 cords released. Um, so we've probably had, with other odds and ends, we probably had close to, I don't know, 45 cords in the past year released. That's amazing. Um, and then I've got uh, one, uh, I think one last question here. Do you have any idea how the cord blood stem cells are helping kids with cerebral palsy? Is it a paracrine effect as suggested with other stem cell uses? Hey, that's a great question. Congrats. Um, so yeah, they're, speaking with Dr. Kurtzberg who's running that, she mentioned the paracrine effect, which could be due to you know multiple reasons, but she's really been focusing in on the monocytes 
Um, maybe the paracrine effect comes from those, but uh, I believe she's she's going to be doing some correlations between the amount of monocytes to the therapeutic effect. But yes, that's that's an excellent question. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Todd. Um, we don't have any other questions coming through, uh, so I think um, that that will be a wrap then. Um, so thank you so much for joining us and for giving us, uh, giving us this informative talk. And it's wonderful to see, um, you know, what's on the horizon for cord blood and also what, what is already, uh, you know, um, cap what we're really capable of doing with it. So we really appreciate your time. Well, thank you. And, you know, feel free to, to forward my email to anybody that has further questions. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Todd. I appreciate that. All right. Thanks for your time. Thank you. So thank you everybody for joining us. Um, I hope you found this uh, very informative. Um, as Todd has said, if anyone has any questions, please do reach out to us um, and we can help answer them for you. Uh, but otherwise, I hope you all have a wonderful day and we hope to connect with you soon at our next webinar. Thank you very much. Bye.